technically kind of early considering the problems. <laughs> yeah, we can put it like that, sure. Uh, I do have a new setup though, so we will need your help with audio testing. It sounded fine in, in when I tested it, but just in case, and of course, uh, in-game sounds will also need uh, you guys, your guys' input. So anyways, um, we are casting the round Ayo, of... there's nothing new. There's nothing new. She's messing with you guys. <laughs> Sure, yeah. Uh, we are casting the round of 32, uh, Tuesday, today, and Thursday, uh, in two days, so, um, and then this Saturday we're casting the round of 16, and onwards, so, that'll be fun. Uh, that does mean that instead of the usual best of threes, we have a best of fives. So that's not tonight, or that's the next time, right? Tonight or is, tonight the best of fives? Tonight is also best of fives. Every single... Series ah. in the round of 32 and upwards, best of five, apparently. I'm not sure about the finals or anything like that, but you do need to leave your co op mission. I need to leave my co op mission, but my partner is going to get so mad at me. Hang on. All right. Let's get into the game. Sorry, for those who don't know, it was taking a little bit of time to get started, so I was killing some time. Let's uh, go ahead and quit out of this. This is during the real world. Yes. Uh, our first series of the day, uh, let me see here, is this one. Yes, there it goes, up on screen, screen right now. So Georgia Tech Esports Remix and Theory, I've cast them before, receives the University of Chicago um, Micro Jordan, I recognize the name, Armadillo. Micro Jordan, yep, yep. And uh, Omega Banana. Fun times. And uh, it was actually nothing so else actually you. We've cast all of these guys in this game at this point, but sure. this is the first time they're playing against each other. Probably. <laughs> yes. No, that that was like a statement more than a question. Oh, okay. Like Thank it's cool because we've we've seen job. everyone at this point, but this is the first time two sets of guys fight each other. Cool. Well, I'm actually gonna get in the game right now. Whoa! Who need to wait? That's I know, weird. right? So crazy. Uh, of course, these are all going to be uh, pretty recent, so they're all in the new maps, and it's actually Legacy of the Void, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so everything looks nice and pretty, and we're on... Uh, how do you pronounce this? What do you say, Elrena? I'm going with Elrena to yeah. right now. Okay, that sounds good enough. Uh, but like I said, the audio might be messed up, guys. I mean, it might be blaring in your ears right now, and I apologize, but uh, let me know, and I'll change it. So hopefully everything's okay, yeah, um... I'll just get into it. Unfortunately, for those who might just be tuning in, over the last, specifically, not even 24 hours, I guess barely in 24 hours, Zomgrim and I have been having hiccups. Uh, it started last night with our TVT North American qualifiers, and for whatever reason, things have just been going poorly since then. Yeah. So definitely looking for feedback in chat to make sure nothing is too crazy for you guys. Yep. But all right, uh, here we go. On the bottom left, as the blue Terran, it is, oh, I've already forgotten, Armadillo and Omega Banana. Haha. <laughs> It kind of looks it's like Omega. Omg. Ah! Arma Omega. Well, in the top left, we've actually got the combination, the Archon Protoss duo of Theory and Remix. Of course, uh, Theory Remix representing Georgia Tech, and it's uh, Armadillo and Omega Banana representing the University of Chicago Team Micro Jordan. There you go. All right, so I, I do recall Theory and Remix quite a bit. I don't know why. Maybe there's their name. Um, Pops in my head or the Protoss. I'm not sure, but uh, I honestly, it's been how long has it been since we cast the CSL? Not like too long of a break, but honestly, because we only do this for about an hour every uh, Tuesday and Thursday, it's not like we have like a, a lot of content to memorize. So I've kind of forgotten. It's like it's two, actually been three weeks? About two, two and a half weeks or so. Because yeah, we didn't do it the week leading before BlizzCon. Uh, I don't believe, or maybe we did. Either way, no. uh, the reason Theory and Remix probably stick in your mind is because we talked about they used to be some pro players. Uh, not exactly folks who ever made, you know, top eight of BlizzCon or anything like that, but Theory and Remix were competitors way before we even heard of the CSL. So uh, whether it was Zotac Cups back, back in the day, or we've probably seen Theory and Remix somewhere along the way. Yeah. Well, that way. So, oh, wait a minute. We have to talk about this. Enough, like, <laughs> chit chat, oh. I suppose. Whoa, it is whoa, whoa. a one base ghost build. Okay. I just want to comment. There, there are people who do this. Like Ruff has done versions of this. I kind of feel like the close air spawns makes this a little bit viable. It's is it a good strat? That you know, we're processing it all the time. But it's one of those things that can and catch its guard, and that's kind of what I think this is intended to do. Just Ooh. get like a quick win in that first game. Yeah, that Reaper almost died. Uh, no Reaper. reason for that to happen. Yeah, actually, my question is: like, there is a reason for it to happen. Where is the mothership core? Skipping it to go faster for that. 
Stargate, it does have a little bit of gas, so you can't put the Stargate down nearly as fast. In this one instance of StarCraft 2, this fast Stargate is going to be great, not for offense, but for defense, because the Oracle will be able to cast Revelation on those personally cloaked ghosts. Personal cloaking, researching as we speak. Yeah. This is very interesting. I mean, you you mentioned that we do see some Terran programmers uh, do weird builds like this, and that, that that is true. But we actually saw this as almost a norm for about a week or two when adepts were super oh, overpowered. Man. A one base ghost build would EMP them, and then, then they would actually be okay. But that that became unnecessary really quickly. I mean, the adepts were nerfed. Uh, people figured it out. And now, uh, through all the casting we've done, it really has become just like almost three base versus three base. To be honest, like oh, that's uh, cool. I forgot about this. Yeah, uh, ghosts have that sniper build. I can put out an adept. Fortunately, can't use it attack though. I feel like their graphic, uh, their model got updated. They look different. Uh, this is the collector's edition one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna say it definitely looks different. Yeah, I have yeah. a collector's edition. I have two collector's I edition, and I haven't twittered on with any of the skins. I, I'm fairly certain it's Collector Edition 1 because they look a little bit more like purifiers than they do regular adepts. I could be wrong though. Mm. Uh, Ghosts are going to get a couple of shots. If they actually want to stop and shoot the Oracle, it'd be great. It can't. Or oh, EMP, not done. That's why. Like... Ooh, EMP, yeah, to keep the Oracle from attacking. I think that's something a lot of people are going to forget though because yeah. it's such a. I don't know, non sequitur to think about. Either way, second, th uh, first Ghost dies. So, second Ghost is still going to kill some probes here. Third one on the way. That Mothership Core could also be EMP. Here, but definitely EMP the Oracle before it can cast Revelation. If a Revelation gets off, this ghost is, yep, there we go, gonna be revealed. Mm. Second ghost, well, actually, this is the third ghost comes in though. Uh, behind this little bit of harassment, we do have our Terrans trying to mack her up, going for a natural as well as two more barracks. Uh, the ghost damage hasn't actually done enough to make up for, you know, the one base build, first of all, the ghost kind of being very expensive, and ghost being very expensive. I mean, it's, it's looking good so far, just based on the fact that you know he's gonna kill another four. Or five pro oracle really lets anything happen because not forget even though the chin might be out from the oracle none less gonna be able to shoot an overcharge maybe goes to the natural base killing a couple probes here it does only take two shots to kill a probe thanks to that bonus damage so the ghost does go down and uh cloaking no longer going to be as big of an issue but already killing 21 yeah. probes like <laughs> you you underestimate just how much damage that is i, I think 10 probes not really worth it but uh this many probably yeah and let's not forget a, a big part of game Getting this many kills off the back end of this being a one base build. They're not vulnerable at home, there are turrets up, but there's going to be things like the SCVs in the natural that will probably oh die. Oh no. Uh, a lot of SCVs are dying, actually. Um, these oracles really aren't being contested. Now, they have three of barracks production now, but, you know, two tech labs, only the reactor just finishing now. They really didn't have that much production, and these oracles, they're returning the damage. Yeah, and just kind of that question of, like, where's the EMP, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, now that the action has calmed down a little, I do want to um, just bring up all the points you're making in chat. So, like I said, thanks for you know telling us the audio issues. Oh my god, a fleet beacon! What the hell? Uh, but thanks for pointing out the audio issues. But the one that you guys really are talking about, where Rifkin's mic is kind of cutting in and out, it's not his mic. His mic is fabulous, um, <sighs> and it's not something I can actually adjust in OBS, as far as I know. It is something that happens to me all the time as his co-caster that usually I only have to deal with, and I just kind of fill in the blanks. <laughs> so. But. I'm not sure what is that because yeah, it, it it tends to be fine to stream and I'm the one streaming. Yeah. Um, so obviously this is an issue now because you're hearing what I'm hearing and I just I honestly don't know how to fix fix it. Uh, it's it should not be an uh, internet problem. Uh, uh, but... You go ahead and just look at this for it. I'm gonna fit, I'm gonna mute myself so I don't blow everyone's ears out. I'm gonna just go up, plug and unplug a bunch of stuff and see if that helps. Okay. It probably won't, but it's worth trying. All right, that makes that makes sense. I have any of your ideas? I mean, sure we'll take them, but. Um... This is usually not an issue uh, for anyone else besides me. And honestly, I've been like kind of lucky in the the last CSL cast. I've been streaming this for the last like four or five times, giving everything a little bit of a break when it comes to observing and whatnot. And um, it hadn't been an issue, so just today's unlucky, I suppose. Oracle's once again coming in, and this time while there are units, they were out of position. So get a couple more kills, and what was once a huge lead for the Terran is back down to a little bit less than normal. Obviously, mules carry the uh, the work account of Terran for a long period of time, but still being down by 12 is not not ideal, especially, you know, around 8 minutes in Legacy of the Void. You're going to want to start thinking about third bases already uh, in a normal game uh, from what we've seen. Like, a third base for Protoss would already be uh, hopefully on its way, actually. But this has not been a very normal game. Ghost Academy 
does a lot of damage. Oracles return a lot of damage. Fleet Beacon comes out. We obviously have Tempests already popping out. One's already out. Uh, interesting choice to go for Tempests, and I'm not entirely sure why they chose to go for Tempests. Um, they, uh, I mean, they were like really good. Well, like I don't know about really good, but obviously they had a, that spell in the very like origins of Beta uh, that made them kind of stupid against buildings and whatnot. But now it's like carriers, even with their advanced build time. Well, that sucks. Losing the War Prism are still like they, if you can get carriers, they're good. Just like if you can get like a good amount of tempests, they're good. I just think the carriers are a little bit more, a little bit better. But we'll see what happens. Uh, the War Prism was going to buy a lot of time. Unfortunately, it died. Uh, the Oracles can always try and get that army to come back like they did once or twice. And uh, that that was hopefully going to buy them more time to get more Tempest. But it looks like even just with two, the, the, the Terran army is quite scared. All right. So. so is this... You can hear me again? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I have plugged and unplugged. Like every, I'm hoping whatever the issues may be uh, no longer persist. But if they no, do, then they I... Are. Don't... It's got to be 100% on my side, so like... And you, you think that the most... The easiest answer would be internet, but internet is one thing I'm not having trouble with nowadays, so... Now it is just a mystery. If I invested into an actual sound card, everything would go better. I wonder if I swapped to the worst mic if it though. Uh, well, we do have a bit of an engagement going on. Of course, these units have been stimmed almost to death, just running ring around the rosy on the one side of the map we never see used, to be honest, was used here. But it looks like the Protoss just might have overwhelming numbers. The Tempest, while they're not very high in numbers, they force out Vikings, which obviously are not helping the ground army. And honestly, uh, Vikings just uh, sometimes they look very terrible. But this has been a very odd game, and it looks like the Protoss are going to be the ones to take it. This is a best of five. Sorry about that. Oh no. Oh no, it's not already a best of... Uh, there we go. There we go. So yeah, so this is a five. Um, I suppose the best of threes you're all probably used to seeing when we cast at this time. And it is going in favor so far of the Protoss, who are up about, yeah, you know, twice the supply. Still no third on the way, but that doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, unfortunately, Terran really not having anything that they're, you know, they're waiting on. They don't have a nice upgrade that's going to you know, skyrocket them to a victory here. Plus one armor might finish, sure, but that's not going to help the overwhelming numbers. Well, better that count doesn't help either. Depth run through everything. GG! And alright, so our Protoss team, Theory and Remix, will be taking the first game in a best of five. Looks like the ne next map, uh... Why is this in Korean? Okay, first of all, why is this in Korean? Is this, does this sound super terrible? It sounds super terrible, that's correct. Uh, I mean, I kind of feel like unless unless I use a... Like, it, unless this one's game two, I don't know what to do, man. Like, I can't contribute if I can't talk, so I don't know what to do. Yeah, it seems like it's breaking out again, too. Do you still want in the game? <laughs> like, I could solo cast. Um, obviously not ideal. I mean, I kind of feel like you're gonna have to because I can't, can't do anything if I can't talk. So uh, maybe solo cast is best of five, and then when it's done, we'll take a break between this and the next series to try and see what what's causing your audio to do this because I I don't like not being able to contribute. <laughs> that sounds like a solid plan. If you guys can't hear him, we don't know what the audio level is like. I can hear him, but uh, basically it sounds like we're going to go into the game number two, and he's just going to let me solo cast the rest of the series, and then we'll take a bit of a break, as we do have to wait for the live cast anyways to really start. These are just from replays right now. The teams are uh, setting up for the next series, so hopefully that'll give us enough time to do something. Not sure. Actually, this has been a problem for me anyways. Like, once or twice every couple of weeks, I would say. Very random, very odd, very sucky. But alright. Uh, we are going to go into game number two. Dusk Towers, for whatever reason, on the replay, it was in Korean. And I was going to try and read it, but unfortunately, this was one of the maps where instead of just basically uh, an English loan word, like dead wing, it was actually the Korean word for Dusk Towers. <laughs> which I don't know. 
All right, game or two. Let me get the scoreboard up, which I was unfortunately missing last game. Here we go. Oh, that's right. Random. Totally forgot. Okay, so in the top position, top right position on Dust Towers, it is the Red Archon, Armadillo, and uh, Omega Banana, I believe that was. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, with the release of Legacy of the Void, you can see Archon players' pings. Not sure if we appreciate that yet or not, to be honest. So far, they haven't been too spammy. Alright, in the bottom left, here's what I was uh, kind of talking about. As the purple Zerg now, it is Theory and Remix. So, yes, random, that's right. Uh, that's probably why I remember you guys. You guys are joking in chat to see you over there. In chat. But, uh, I forgot that you guys are random. Anyway, so it's still CBT. Obviously, these guys haven't changed race. Feel comfortable playing Terran. We'll see what the Zerg uh, style looks like from Theory and Remix. Obviously, they went for a fast fleet beacon last game. We'll see if they have anything else kind of weird up their sleeves for this race in particular. So far, just kind of normal. Uh, a little abnormal just because they took their th uh, third as their natural. But that is acceptable on maps like this. You know, it's uh, you have this pocket expansion that now, if you take it as a third, then it, it just has a little bit more minerals, a little bit you know safer uh, the longer the game goes. Also, you can accelerate your creep spread if that is one of your main goals. Throughout Legacy of the Void uh, beta, for whatever reason, probably because they were too busy focusing on you know like uh, figuring out the new units, figuring out the new tempo of the game, you know the flow of the game, that basic mechanics like creep spread were kind of lost. That was like kind of on the last thing on, on Zerg's mind, you know, they were more focused on uh, Nidus all winning or building Ravager or something like that. But with the release of Legacy of the Void, I've actually been seeing, of course, the regular old, you know, pro gamers who were like very dependent on their creep spread bring it back in a big fashion. I should be quite insane with it. It's, it's not like it's any worse than Legacy of the Void. It does expand and recede quicker, but it obviously is still very useful against Terran, against all races. I mean, at one point or another, if you're good enough, it gives you, like, math hacks. But this Reaper's a little bit annoying, but this time... Archon uh, does have something to deal with it. Queen's course. Looks like we have a two-base build coming out for Terran. Camera freezes too? I didn't even actually notice. Okay. Sorry, a little bit distracted. Uh, two Reapers now. Still not really enough to deal with the Queen unless the micro is, you know, is, is off point and uh, no lings are made, basically. And then eventually it could tango with the Queen. But it really should not go down. If this Queen goes down, it was a big mess up from our Zerg. Twelve lings are actually on the way. As well as that speed about to finish up, so these Reapers are running out of time to do anything else. They really should just go for... They should probably just leave, and then, uh, you know, a little bit later go in for a scout one at a time, just suicide them. Try and see if there's a roach one on the way or something like that. Speaking of scouting, this overlord just got in and out, no problem. <laughs> there's, there's been no marines. What is it seen here? Oh, well, okay, I guess it, they expected marines, so they sent the overlord back. But unfortunately, they could have gotten a full scout in the two-base build. And know what they're getting into. But they do have a lot of lings floating across the map, so maybe not so worried about defending. Or they're just uh, you know, trying to get a good attack in. Tries to get the Hellions. We'll get one Hellion, both Hellions, and all of the Reapers, too. Not bad, considering they saved at least half of them. Not the lings. Uh, this two base build was pretty popular when QXC and BCQD were kind of the king of beta. This was almost uh, their go-to, but they usually um, had tank drops accompany it with, uh, with it, too. Uh, tank drops have been kind of weird, besides being nerfed recently, you know, in the last month or whatever. They also just had uh, periods of being good versus bad. Uh, so basically, they were, you know, they were hard to control. Uh, you had people going for one and not doing a lot, and then figuring out two was a lot better, but then Zergs got a lot better at defending against it. They started going for two base layers, so they stopped going for tank drops. Um, just really depended on how people were getting better and better at the actual game as a whole. Uh, and now they're kind of in a, a position where it's like, sometimes you'll go for a tank drop, but not always, obviously. But if you do go for the tank drops, you manage to save them. They can be excellent versus a Knight Assault in, which is exactly what's happening. And they can also just be excellent for a follow-up two-base push. Um, that is actually really strong with BCQD and uh, Q. 
QX you're doing it. I mean, as individuals and as an Archon, because they're also a, quite a strong Archon. Although the Nidus Worm is almost finished up, and unfortunately, since, since the Reapers died, they weren't able to, you know, kind of sneak off here and then try and jump up when the uh, Zerg wasn't paying attention. And there is the Nidus Worm, so far undetected. Unfortunately, even if you see it, the only thing you can really do is, is try and, and get your units as close as possible to immediately shoot it down, as it is invincible whilst building. But that is still better than absolutely nothing, which is exactly what our Terran is doing. So nothing happens. The Queens pop out first, so they can get the Transfuses if necessary. They can deal with Liberators if necessary. Uh, they can also Transfuse, of course, if they don't need to do anything else. Now, that is a big bio army, and they ended up funneling in the Queens and the Roaches, not anticipating the two base build might have just been their downfall here as uh, you know if this is a three base build where they went you know a lot of hellions and then maybe took their time on their production got you know uh, upgrades or something like that there wouldn't be a lot of army and an unscouted nidus worm would absolutely have killed them but because they've been producing off of three barracks for quite a while as well as getting their uh, you know their most important upgrades like stim and combat shields that wasn't so hard to deal with now it looks like the remix are going to go ahead and just follow up with another all-in, which isn't a bad idea. Unfortunately, when you do a Nidus Worm like that, even off of three bases, look at their drone count, 29. Uh, you really can't follow up with a macro game unless the Terran really messes up, so... You're usually just forcing it going for a follow-up all-in, or... trying to, uh, basically get as many as possible and have the best defense against what you know is a follow-up push, and then maybe you do decide to macro, or, again, all in. The point is, they first have to get these units before trying to get that drone count up high. So besides attacking, which they are free to do, basically, with two medevacs, I mean, this is, this is a free push, or it should be if they're good on their pickup micro. Um, there's no reason not to. Clean up creeps, see what type of armor they have, make sure they're not getting away with droning or teching, but behind it, they're also getting their third CC, as well as all of their upgrades and production. So obviously, you can see in the supply, that's just a really good game for Terran right now. Uh, absolutely slaughtering the Nidus Worm was... well, is usually a win. Uh, Stim, to get away, there you go, not gonna get with quite everything, but just enough. And now those two medevacs are free to float around, and go into the main, into the natural, while the uh, macro Archon mode player is, you know, just macroing at home. This is the beauty of Archon mode, which you haven't really talked about yet, I suppose. So, the 300 that are tuning in are just about. If you don't know Archon mode, you have intention to CSL at all, I guess a quick rundown whilst they, uh, kind of macro up the army to basically win, I'm guessing. Uh, CSL is the Collegiate Star League, it's really cool, These are they are playing for their college team as if it was college sports, so that's uh, really cool. It's been happening for quite a few years, actually, um, and they just asked us if we wanted to, uh, you know, join and cast and help out, and we said, sure. Uh, but Archon mode is, of course, the new mode in Legacy of the Void, where one player can do one thing, another player can do another, but they control the same race. So, the most common way to divvy up the jobs is by just doing... Uh, one macro, one micro, although different Archon teams have been experimenting with different ways of splitting actions up. So, for instance, I know uh, one of the pro gaming teams split up, basically, ev one person did everything, and then the other person was simply a spotter, and that actually worked. I think that was Dongar Gu and whoever his partner was for Red Bull, for instance. But this does look like a bit of a death push, even though Baneling Speed is finished, which is surprising they were allowed to do that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, versus a, a much, much bigger army, and the Roaches, uh, as few as there are, are still inflating the supply. It's not even a good supply. Didn't take any Banelings to the face, so they looked good to go to win this game, and that will even up the score. So while the Nidus Worm is a very powerful all-in, and you, if you follow the, the pro scene at all, and any of the pro gamers on Twitter, you know that there has been a lot of complaints about Nidus Worm, and that being invincible whilst building might be a little too powerful. But there are our games, and we've seen more and more of them, uh, where builds are really starting to uh, expand and conflict with each other, that the Nidus Worm just looks really, uh, actually quite lame. <laughs> you know, if they do go for the two base, for instance, then it's easy to deal with. These are from replays, so there really is no reason to sit around and, I don't know, bicker or whatever. Well, usually I'm bickering, but Rickon's not here, so. Womp womp. Well, it's not that I'm nice. Oh, hello. Sure. <laughs> but there is no reason to, uh, to dilly-dally, so. 
We do have uh, the second series of the day basically setting up probably right now. It is 10.30. I believe that's when they were told to get ready, so they're probably ready in the, in the corner or whatever. But we still have a couple more games to go. It is all tied up now. There we go. And we are in Ruins of Saras, so one of the maps that was uh, in beta the, in the entire time, basically, beta. This, Lairlac Crescent, Orbital Shipyard, still in, uh, where, of course, those other new maps are still being figured out. On the bottom right, as the Red Terran in his armadillo and Omega Banana. And in the bottom left, as the Purple Protoss, once again Protoss, in his remix and Theo. Okay, so... Theory. What did I say? Oh, Theo. Theo. <laughs> My bad. Theory. It was bound to happen one day. Look, see, I got your back. Thanks, if I can't bro. <laughs> cast. <laughs> you can fix me on their names. Yeah, and I think, yeah, with replays, you can't even see who's in the game, so I can't even cheat that way by showing the F11 panel. <laughs> oh, well. Actually, while the game is still heating up... Oh, I forgot. This pauses the game. My B. just wanted to change my... drag. There you go. Okay. Don't know why that happened. I know we have, uh, of course... I believe she said logic in, in chat, so I don't know what happened to chat, but alright, I trust that uh, that was on purpose. Alright, okay, so back to the little PVT. This is, of course, the race that our uh, purple team won with. Uh, going for a Nidus Worm with Zerg is not a bad idea once again. It just didn't work out specifically versus what uh, Terran was doing. Sometimes happens. We can go back to what you, what you won with, and that's cool. Now, the question is, does our red team go for some wonky one base build again? Looks like not. Second Command Center is on the high ground, so they are playing pretty conservative. Um... The CSL is a little interesting, and kind of give like a brief overview in that last series, at the end of it. But um, besides being like an awesome, like initiative, you know, one day esports mainstream, whatever, whatever, and actually people will pay attention to their their college back, you know, ten years ago, fighting in StarCraft Three, something like that. As awesome as that is, um, right now watching these uh, these teams play Archon mode, to be honest, it's a little funky. Uh, sometimes we see people who looked like uh, or teams rather that looked like they studied Archon mode three months ago, um, but not recently. Sometimes we see people who don't look like they studied Legacy of the Void much at all and are just kind of experimenting. And we know for a fact actually that was the case for some teams. They would just freely admit, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. This is my first time using the Disruptor. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, these two teams, I remember, like, are, are pretty, um... Uh, what's a confident? It sounds uh, demeaning. Uh, <laughs> they're pretty well versed. There you go. Uh, in Legacy of the Void, but the, you know that Ghost build, for instance, was something that felt like I was watching Legacy of the Void three, four months ago instead of you know what it is now, which seems to be expanding further and further into uh, the faster you get to three bases, the better uh, off you are. Terran is in a little bit of a rough spot, actually, about that third base. Uh, Zerg obviously always wanted to go for a third base pretty quickly. Uh, Protoss. Um, now, uh, kind of a third race, third base race too. Terrans kind of get, like, they, they can't really get away with the third base super quick, but they would like to, and, and they still try. But sometimes you see crazy fast thirds from Protoss, and that just feels and looks weird as someone who's been in the heart of the swarm for a very long time. But anyways, um, so playing as conservative as they are is a little odd too. Uh, you know, they got the ghost build, and then they still put their command center on top. This is back when adepts were pretty powerful. You just had to have a wall off, and you had to play super defensive. Uh, doesn't really, not, not really the case anymore, although it is definitely safe. So it does uh, land the command center. Looks like they have missile turrets a bit blind, or did they, oh, they saw the stargate back here. There we go. Okay, so what is Protoss seeing? Protoss has seen nothing. They actually did not know where the opponent was, so that's a problem. That's why the Oracle was flying around like that. But it was just taking a, a wide turn around to try and get by sneakily. But oddly enough, there's a SCV over here, so this would be the least sneaky path they could have done it. So uh, Missile Turret's obviously going to be a good idea. Um, definitely necessary so they don't have to be pulled back every single time an Oracle uh, delves into the mineral line. Which happened in the first game, by the way. They, were, they pulled back, I think, well, once at least, and I, I think twice, um, which did not help that game. You know, they end up losing for a variety of reasons, but that certainly didn't help, you know, off their timings and whatnot. 
But the Oracle isn't useless just because the Missile Turret is down in both mineral lines. Um, besides being able to pick off SCV's building and just being generally annoying, I mean, two Oracles technically could try and take down a Supply Depot, uh, you now have those Stasis Traps, which can be very useful. Uh, they buy a lot of time, they provide a little bit of scouting. Uh, Oracles, obviously, with their relations, still provide the same scouting they did in Heart of the Swarm. And if your opponents were going for a ghost build, they would still be useful. Am I coming to teach tomorrow at NYU? Yes, actually. Uh, if uh, Again, if y'all don't know, I do teach, and this is uh, some of my last week's teaching at NYU, like the school. NYU Magnet School, to be more specific. Uh, so I, I should have a bit more investment into the CSL, especially since there are, uh, I think, two or three NYU teams, apparently. But uh, I actually don't feel much affiliation with NYU. I basically take a 12-hour trip back and forth, teach a three-hour class, which is awesome, but the traveling sucks, and then I'm out of New York in a flash. So don't even get to experience any New York things. But I've been there enough not to have anyone try and make me too sightseeing. I've seen most of everything it has to give. All right, so the Reaper hasn't been doing much. Didn't really get anything done besides that, you know, pretty crucial scout. So I shouldn't say it hasn't done anything. I haven't seen much beyond that. It is obviously a, a macro game. Uh, this is looking a lot more like we see in recent Legacy of the Void games. Um, except that the Protoss has not gone for that third base yet. So now they're going for it. And this is still like a quicker third base than you would usually be allowed in like Heart of the Swarm, where they're still trying to get Colossus, and it's still quite scary to move out with a small army. Legacy of the Void, basically the faster you can get your third, the better off you are, as you can get that big burst of production. Um, many games we see now with Protoss, basically, uh, is a fast third base, and then like slap down six to eight gateways really quickly. And it's a, it's a big burst. It was a build that existed in Heart of the Swarm, it was just really hard to pull off. And like, I think one of the most infamous ones was Parting slapped Flash with it in Pro League. But now it's a norm in Legacy of the Void to get that high uh, rate of production, because Adepts are usually your bread and butter. And you can make a lot of them. Uh, it looks like Terran just about ready to move out. Oh, whoops, I thought there was medevacs. There they are. There they are. So, yeah. Usually the first two medevacs is a good enough single to move out, but you can wait for a bigger army. Uh, sometimes by doing this, you can kind of catch the Protoss off guard because they're expecting one timing and are hit by another uh, stronger timing, and or maybe playing a little too defensively, which might have been the case here. Uh, like I said, the third base wasn't as quick as it could have been in general, and in this game specifically, as our Terran have really not moved out at all. Now they're finally moving out with a very large army, yeah, but obviously one that could have attacked sooner with um, simply two medevacs. A snipe and then observer. Unfortunately, they are still, you know, have revelation on them, so... Still sees where they are, still sees them not moving out. Uh, this obviously is a big map in general, but they are, you know, horizontal spawns, so... Protoss does have to be worried, you know, once the Terran moves out, they're probably gonna be at your base pretty darn quick. Liberators are a good addition. Uh, for the most part, PVT looks similar for Terran. Protoss, unfortunately, is the Void, really had to adapt. They had to do a lot of uh, fixing and, and rebuilding and whatnot, but Terran, you know, usually you can still get away with a good old bio ball, but if you add Liberators, then you're upping your composition quite a bit, and actually they can be quite difficult to deal with for the Protoss, especially when they get into those numbers of 6 or 8 in the late game. Mid-game, you can kind of snipe them off, especially if you went for a blink build, but uh, even in the mid-game, if they get into a nice choke on uh, some different maps, they are quite difficult to deal with. Uh, Ruins of Saras, luckily, not so much chokes, but obviously four Liberators would still cover it. A uh, bit of a big drop in the main base, obviously takes care of those warp-ins easy-peasy. We do have our Protoss going for Storm, which is um, becoming more and more the norm, too, by the way. Going for Adepts into Storm and like Charged Archon. Uh, one of the worst things about Adepts, unfortunately, now is that they just they can't attack air. So even though they are a good buffer and you can produce a lot of them very quickly with a lot of gateways, you can't deal with drops so easily. And that's where the High Templars do. Oh, stop attacking that! Stop. Uh, that's where the High Templars come into play, and that's where they kind of complement each other. Um, but again, unfortunately, uh, Protoss still seems to be having some difficulty perfecting this build and this composition. Uh, it just Terrans eventually look to overwhelm them even if they do have a lot of storms. And of course, the major thing about Legacy of the Void is that you're starting to run on your minerals very quickly in your main and natural, so... 
Uh, actually, a third base for Terran was pretty darn late. <laughs> Only just now setting up an orbital and, of course, not even mining? Damn. Their production uh, should not really be that good in like a minute or two here. They might have a little bit of a, you know, a downgrade in their barracks production, but uh, they could easily float that main command center to a fourth and just keep it up. We'll see what happens. Drop on the main dealt with by DTs, actually. This might be really useful for the Protoss, but it also did reveal <laughs> that they have DTs. They, they might have been able to get in somewhere else. Hard though. You know they had missile turrets because you went for oracles, so I don't know about that. I guess there was a uh, ping to show the DT was in their face. Tried to scan it and then it dodged. Got some liberators out, or okay, by some I mean one. I could have sworn they were making more. Oh, two went off to go ahead and harass the main base. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. If you're, uh, you know, distracting them on one side, then maybe you can get in on the other. But unfortunately, as it is Archon mode, uh, usually it doesn't happen. Not nearly as easily as it did before. Uh, but the Liberator should survive, because the micro player should be looking after them. Fourth base goes down on this location, probably the better location, to be honest. Uh, this one obviously goes towards your opponent. And while that was usually... Well, that was better and harder to swarm for Protoss, is around this time, three or four bases, they have a pretty big, beefy army, and they want to start being, you know, pressuring the Terran. And Legacy of the Void, that's not the case. This just means you're closer to being able to be set up by Liberators. <laughs> And you don't, you don't want that. Uh, Terran, uh, not really applying a ton of pressure, just a couple of drops, doing a decent enough job. Trying to get their upgrades too. Upgrades not really a big point on, on either player's team here, in this game specifically, but they're on their way. Uh, they are starting to get to that late, late game though. You know, they're not quite maxed out, but everyone's getting the tech that looks like late game. So we have Tempest versus Ghost Liberator. Tempest's... If the composition of the Terran is really perfect, like, so again, 6-8 Liberators, a big bio ball, and maybe some Ghosts, Tempests are still really hard to get to work uh, versus them. But it is, it does seem to be, like, the best option. Just, like, theoretically, if you think about it, like, they have the range to snipe those Liberators. They should be what you should get, but uh, they're expensive, and, of course, they're uh, kind of slow to build. And they don't help out much afterwards, too. If Marines get under them, they, you know, they die pretty quickly. So, uh... We did catch a pretty nice game, Huck versus, and I can't remember, Rifkin probably remembers. Um, but Huck played a nice TDP that did include every sing everything you see here, a very similar setup. Semper! How do you not- it's Semper! Whatever. So yeah, Huck versus Semper. It was a really nice PvT that showcased what PvT might look to be in every single game. Oh no, Truman Vex just randomly into the war and the uh, Canada. Yeah, that might be what PvT looks like in the future. Or might not? We have no idea. That's the beauty of Legacy of the Void. <laughs> Hell, Bio might not even be what you do in Legacy of the Void. No, I'm just kidding. Bio is, of course, what you're doing in Legacy of the Void. The economy really screwed up mech in all situations. Versus Zerg, versus Terran, versus versus Protoss. Um, not that mech was doing so well versus Protoss anyways, but... People were really hoping and hard of the swarm mech would come back. It kind of did, at least in TBT. And then people were really hoping that maybe it could be used versus Protoss in Legacy of the Void. No, and now it really can't be used at all. So, <laughs> rip mech, 2015. Uh, adding an immortal is not a bad idea. You do have that happen in Heart of the Swarm, too. It just as the Marauder count starts to get really, really quite high, and the Viking count would get high, so Colossus would go down quickly, immortals would be a bit better at dealing with that. And like I see the Void, um, Hard to say if that's really what you still want to do, as usually at this point it's liberators that are, you know, really making you cry, not not mass marauders. But that's not really what the Terran has right now. Terran went a couple of liberators, I thought they were going to get some really, like, OP counts. Not really. In fact, they went back into Vikings, kind of. I, mm, I thought I was really going to like what the Terran was doing, and now they're kind of disappointing me, to be honest. Uh, oh, no cancel. That's a nice snipe. But no medevax means that this army is going to just perish. Stims to death. But does draw the Protoss army out of position. Tempest and a couple of storms are here to help out. Not too many marines. The storm barely misses the heart of the marines. If they had taken them all out, then, well, eventually a Tempest would have carried and uh, killed all the marauders. But all the Tempests die, one more storm comes through and finally kills those marines. But the third will die as well. So now you're back down to almost one base mining for the Protoss. And it seems like there are uh, best course of action here is to uh, kind of all in. 
uh, just throwing their army, whatever they have left of their army, towards their Terran opponent. But a Liberator, well, actually, Liberator's not bad at all. Never mind, it was completely in the wrong position. That, again, a high Liberator count, just like a high tank count, can be uh, amazing in a defensive situation. You know, you lift up your third, you just take the ramp again, you siege up everything, and the, the Protoss is never breaking that. But they didn't go for a high Liberator count. All they had was bio units that kind of uh, were caught a little bit by surprise with this counterattack, and it's turning into a little bit of a base trade. So far, a literal one, where they trade one base for one, but maybe an actual base race soon? Who does to say? The DTs are going to be absolutely instrumental in this, though. Obviously taking care, one-shotting uh, a lot of these units anyways, but especially as stimmed as they are, the lack of medevacs, the lack of star port production in general, I suppose, has really been uh, what is, is losing the Terra in this game. So they kind of went Liberators, decided I didn't want the Liberators, kind of went Vikings, no Vikings, and then uh, not having a high medevac count really at any point in the game has really screwed their bio. And it looks like Kratos is going to take it. This was a good game from the Terran, but I, I definitely think it could have been a better one throughout. And of course, in the last minute there, uh, they just kind of got blindsided by a counterattack. They weren't weren't quite expecting. <clears throat> All right, so that brings Remix in theory up to one for Georgia Tech. Get into the next game, game number four. It's going to be an orbital shipyard. If you guys just tuning in, know that Rifkin is here. He just, you know, yelled at me for not remembering Semper, so, you know, that's cool. Uh, but we're trying to fix his mic, and we consider, we just said, basically, right now, let me solo cast, and then... It's not my mic that's the Oh, yes, you're, you're right. I'm sorry. So, basically, something is happening where I hear his mic messing up, and, of course, the stream hears it, because I am doing production for once. But we decided to fix it after this series. We have a little bit of downtime waiting for the next team to set up. Instead of, you know, fixing it on the fly and just uh, tilting everyone. Me, Rifkin, viewers, everyone alike. A little bit cleaner this way, but it doesn't mean I'm solo casting. So, if you don't enjoy me, well, I, I hate you. And leave, anyways. I'm not going to apologize for that. But if you don't like solo casting, I don't actually blame you. Sometimes solo casting is just grating. But anyways, uh, we are into this game. It's game number four. Up here in the top right, as Terran now, it is the purple Terran remix in theory. In the bottom left, as the red Terran, it is Armadillo and Omega Banana. Well, I'm always on the cusp of forgetting their names, then just barely remember. Okay, so a TBT on Orbital Shipyard, one of the most uh, popular builds you've been seeing on this map, in this matchup specifically, is a two Reaper build. So you either try and hide the second Reaper, uh, second Rax rather, sneakily or not sneakily, or you just let them see it and you just try to do it anyways. You can also proxy the second or both <laughs> Raxes and go for Reapers. Basically, Reapers are good in this map, okay? It's not, you didn't get the gist, there it is. Uh, why? Because there's a ton of space to jump up. So... It can be very effective. It can win games just straight up if it's not handled uh, basically perfectly initially and then, you know, per uh, handled well throughout. If that one Reaper gets your entire army killed and sometimes the entire army is one or two Marines, then you're in trouble. That's not the case here. We do have just expand builds. One Reaper expands. Pretty popular. Uh, well, actually, in this case, no Reaper for these guys. No units at all for these guys. A little bit worrying, but they do have two marines coming out now. Hmm. Just pointing out probably where the reaper would show up. Um. I'm actually not sure why they're sending the reaper back. What did they see? They think they're gonna. They haven't seen anything, so they, they really don't know. They could be expecting two rax reaper, or like, oh shit, we forgot that it was a popular build. Let's worry about that. Or they could be expecting one reaper that's just hiding somewhere, and they really don't want to be scouted and trying to intercept it. But there is no reaper, so their own reaper is a little bit useless. They do want to get a scout eventually, but the more time they give uh, the marines to spread out like this, the less chance they have of getting a scout. They won't know if it's a Banshee, a Raven, a Hellion opener, a Medivac opener, or in some cases, more recently, Cyclone openers and Liberator openers. Uh, during the anti qualifiers yesterday, we saw some Liberator openers. Uh, seemed very stylistic, but in some cases it did work. And then throughout the NA and Korean qualifiers of our TVT only tournament, 
we saw a lot of Cyclone openers. Uh, Cyclone doesn't have a big part in TVT throughout the game. In fact, very little at all. Uh, like I said before, mech, not really a thing anymore, kind of sucks, and in general you didn't want to go Cyclones with mech anyways. People experimented with that when Cyclones were OP and they still didn't like it in TVT. Um, but now they just, you know, not used at all in the mid to late game. But in the early game, oh, Reaper does die. Uh, in the early game, they are perfect catch-alls. They deal with medevac drops, they deal with the Hellion openers, they deal with the Banshee openers, as long as you can have a scan. Uh, they are just a perfect catch-all unit, and uh, definitely probably one we're going to see more and more. I imagine, this is just a guess of course, that we're going to see them kind of like Reapers, where sure they only have one very specific role, but it is a very important role, and certainly uh, useful for getting uh, as soon as possible. And here we have double medevacs coming out for our red team, which is a little odd. Uh, you know, double viking openers have kind of fallen out of fashion. Uh, you know, basically vikings have gone through a period of time where you, the more vikings the better, the faster the vikings the better. Now, not so much. But for double medevacs straight off the bat versus Terran, uh, with no upgrades, like no steam or anything like that, that is a little odd. But we'll see what happens. I mean, you see this, uh, you know, the, the fast two medevac drops can be a popular style in TVZ, but with Stim. Uh, and then you just hope they don't have mutas out to, to catch you. Uh, this can happen in uh, versus Protoss, but usually again only with one medevac. And with Terran versus Terran, it's usually a one medevac, you know, and, and a widow mine. So we'll see. Hellions are already in a position. Of course, it's orbital shipyards, so you know where a drop is going to come. It just—it's a no-brainer. A Viking's going to be able to potentially take out these medevacs, and they do want them for healing as long as possible. The Hellions roast and toast the Marines as they drop out of the medevac, and while at the last second, our Red Archon team tried to spread them out around the Hellions, the Hellions did their job. They killed a couple Marines, and they bought time for the rest of the uh, reinforcements to come. And that drop was not very successful at all. Oh, and if he loses the medevac, oh, he loses it too. It just saves four marines, not worth at all. Um, at the very least, that that drop could have been, you know, questionable in how much damage it could do, but useful in that it was a constant threat if you got him out alive. Then you split up the medevacs, you know, have one person control one and the other person control the other and just constantly try and harass. And that at least buys you time and scouting so you can get a faster third base, uh, get faster upgrades like they're trying to do. And know that you're safe. Now they could be a little blind. Oddly enough, a marine just walks right in, but even then, that's not quite the same as having that consistent scouting, consistent pressure, consistent threat that uh, medevacs being alive would have had. Obviously, getting two medevacs rather quickly be, uh, you know, right afterwards, but not a lot of units to put in it. For whatever reason, also including marauders into the mix, not usually what you want in TVT if you know it's going to be marine, ta marine tank versus marine tank. Uh, they might not have known that until recently. They did get the marine in there to see that barracks were on the way. Maybe they saw the Hellions and limited amount of marines and thought mech was a possibility. And I don't necessarily blame them for that. Even though we could go over tons of reasons why mech is no longer very good, we still see people do it. So, I guess it's a better idea to get those two marauders just in case it is mass Hellions and tanks than to, uh, than to not. Oh, they're still getting marauders. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, this is kind of like TVT 101, but basically Marauders, even though they have like higher health, the DPS uh, and the cost of them is not worth the, you know, it's not worth. So you could get two Marines and have better DPS, <laughs> as well as tanks too, and, and have a better army. We'll see what happens. Viking control obviously going in favor of our purple Terran, so yeah, like I said, that's kind of gone between like being super important and not super important. Uh, you know, it's useful because you can shoot down medevacs and you can shoot down tank drops more specifically, and of course they provide that sight. Tanks have more sight than they do, uh, or they have more range than they do actual sight. Sorry, my bad. But they just uh, they also take up you know. A lot of production and a lot of minerals and gas to get there, so sometimes you can get overwhelmed if you're trying to get that Viking control too early. In this case, that's not going to be what's happening. They are not getting overwhelmed anytime soon. They have, uh, you know, they're they're covering their tracks. They know where the army is. A little bit of a spread might be in order just to make sure they know where their army is. That's something that's done really well by our red team. 
widow mines littering the field. Uh, uh, annoying, first of all, when the army starts moving out, but second of all, getting a lot of scouting done. If they're not using their factory for, for tanks, which they're not, and I don't agree with, then it is cool to see them use it for something else like Widow Mines to get that scouting. Uh, they do have some pretty great upgrades, too, by the way. They have the Zillow Engineering Base pretty quickly. So 2-2 two, two already on the way. They're like, what, 40 seconds faster? They have Stim and Combat Shields over their opponents, too, although Stim is uh, just a little bit away from finishing. A big drop is going to head right into Vikings and a missile turret. No, no, no. Uh, you usually scan before you do something as risky as that, but then again, the scan could alert them that it's going to be a risky maneuver. And that's uh, sometimes makes them be in position, but that was that was dangerous. So clearly loses, loses one medevac. Uh, such a big deal. Uh, supplies are uh, pretty even right now. Uh, workers a lot higher for Remix in theory, but... I also think that their army composition in general is better, if their army supply is less. I am really confused by uh, t uh, Red Terran's <laughs> composition. I really hate harping on it so much too, because it, it is, it, it's, it's going to be consistent. You're going to be like, Zombie Gup, shut up, like we get they're supposed to go marine tank, but I can't shut up about it because in every single fight they're going to have for however long this game lasts, 10, 20 minutes, is going to go poorly for them or not as good as it could have if they had just gotten the correct composition. Oh, there's a drop over here. They're dropping towards it. It is, it is really important and it's really quite like, ugh, why, why not? Why not? Point that's already done, and an orbital too, in fact. A little bit risky not to put that into a planetary. Oh, dropping the natural, doing a little bit of damage. Could go for the, the upgrades, prob probably should go for the upgrades, because they are far ahead. Uh, mass repair goes down though, and we'll save this one. Uh, that was what, plus two uh, weapons. And the other one is not going to go down. Just goes for the SCVs the last second, increasing their SCV lead. Fourth and fifth base on the way for Remix in Theory. Jeez. <clears throat> I guess they were banking quite a few minerals in there. They're getting to that point where they're they're inevitably going to be getting getting maxed as they they haven't really been facing each other out in the middle of the map. It's been about drops and pokes, which these drops are not going to go apparently. What's the Hellbat doing here? I'm really thinking Hellions. <laughs> Well, he'll help out one day. Scan's going down everywhere, unfortunately not using a uh, mod, so we can't actually see where. I just imagine around the map, basically. Uh, seeing, uh, first of all, these widow mines that were scattered around, if you recall. <laughs> it's going to be annoying for remakes in theory. But also seeing where the army is. The worst thing that can happen in a TVT, especially on this map, where you have this huge blocker in the middle that's blocked by rocks here, is uh, you go this way, and your opponent goes this way, and whoever scouts that you're going the opposite direction first is usually the one to win, because that's they start pulling up tanks in their main base and protect their production. It happens a lot on this map, and it is very infuriating to be in a good position and let that happen and then lose. Drops left and right for Red Terran, looking really nice here. Got a couple of SCVs, got a Gas Geyser, uh, but the, uh, half of their army is caught in the middle of the map. I thought they were potentially going to get maybe a four, uh, a, f a four pronged attack. That's that's what you call it, a four pronged attack off. But instead, they kind of get a two pronged attack that is both getting cleaned up now, anyways. And the fourth one was taken care of, but the third one, the third one does in fact get into the third base. This is what I thought was going to happen. They weren't met by the army, they are doing a ton of damage, but it's only marines on a couple marauders. There's no tanks, and there's no tanks back at home either. So on a base trade scenario where, oh, I think he's going to all in me, his army's not coming back to come home, you would start pulling tanks from your two or three factories at this point back at home, have a really nice defensive position. There is no really great defensive position. I mean, sure, you have the concave on top of the ramp, but that doesn't overtake what tanks could have been. Uh, let's not forget that you can carry tanks. There hasn't been a lot of that in this game specifically, but TVT is usually all about that. No medevacs too, because they try to get the Viking control, I suppose. But it's, uh, it's still available. This one medevac is going to just carry that around forever. The outburst of DPS from mass marines is so sick, and they do have decent upgrades now too. Uh, tanks on the backside are, uh, might get sniped. No, no, they're too stimmed. Uh, there's, ah, it's too, too small of an army. Too small of an army, too stimmed. Uh, running up a ramp, of course, too. Just gets obliterated by the tanks. 
And uh, while they did, I guess they were <laughs> anticipating a base trade, and they also had those extra command centers, it doesn't matter. They've been scouted, their production is going under. In TVT, whoever gets on top of production first usually does win, unless the other person's army is just a lot bigger. I think Remix in theory definitely got this. Uh, back at home, they've kind of set up, realizing this could get dicey. Uh, they're probably going to win unless an own like the, the Doom Drop kills them. This was not that Doom Drop. First of all, it gets sniped off by Mizzle Turret. Second of all, it was only one medevac with half the units in it. Not too scary. Production can easily handle this. GG! Are you guys in front of the camera? I don't have your camera up on my monitor, so that's why I didn't see it. But I'm also totally professional. It's probably for the best that it's not doing some uh, safe work dancing. Oh, thank God. Thank God it wasn't looking. <laughs> okay, so that does mean, sorry, that was the end of the series. Uh, Remix, in theory, took it 3-1. Playing three different races, too. But alright, uh, I guess we gotta check to see if the other team is ready to go. Turn CSL, here we go. And if they are, we'll set up the lobby, but even if they are, we do need to fix, fix this, this issue with, with me, basically. Rifkin's mic keeps on distorting and cutting out for me specifically. It doesn't happen when he streams, even though I hear it, but because you guys hear what I hear now. It's all gone to hell. So what do you think we should do first? Uh, well, the other team seem to be questioning what's going on anyway, so let's fiddle, I guess. Okay. This is like on-the-fly fiddling, and here's the thing, guys. We really have no idea what is causing this. Um, so as we're talking now, nothing is happening. Maybe something like... Well, what if I came for a moment like this? Just tell me where it starts cutting out if I just start running my train of thought because I'm playing a phone game while we're waiting to speak and that's it's not quite the cat yeah, you've been playing, right but there. it's oh, some. See, I, I'm pretty sure it's it's. People are saying it's your internet. I don't think that's the case though. It would make the most sense because they also said that your uh, camera was starting to freeze up too, but my internet is is baller. <laughs> I'll go yeah, check it. Yeah, Zombie Grip has like a hundred up lately. Uh, let's see. Um... Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the site. Speed test. Well, I ended up remembering it. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't remember where's my speed at, guys. Because <laughs> the problem is when there's lag involved, yes, the mic would get fuzzy, it would get funny and distorted. That would make sense. But the fact that it's straight up cutting out does not make sense to me at all. So my download is 101 and my upload is about 68. Yeah, fuck you. I've got like 100 down and 5 up. So it, it shouldn't be the internet. So it, it blows down to, which... <laughs> what else is there? Um, I don't know why I'd be my computer. It's not being stressed right now. Um, your, in your actual sound settings, playback devices, none of that stuff, like you've unchecked a lot of applications to take control on all of them, right? Let's see here. I disabled my microphone from my webcam. Disabled my microphone from my headset. I can try talking now. What, me or... H hello? hello, senpai. Are you th th there? See, you're stuttering. It's really hard to tell if you're actually stuttering. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not stuttering. <laughs> right. Senpai, are you there? I can't tell. I'm just talking to see if it cuts out. I am walking and talking and chewing bubble gum, pretending like I'm casting a game. There's a Terran and a Protoss in front of me, except there's not because we don't know what the teams coming to be while I speak in one long continuous sentence this becomes more and more difficult because I don't know what I want to say next and stopping at any point would not help the cause of testing with yeah, this break of speech yeah. I don't know man I do not know I don't know 
I mean, I've been doing this. I've been like recording my mic on my end, and there's no cutting out at all. So. I have no clue, Zombie Group, how to fix this because I don't know what's causing it. It is very frustrating, and I, I, I don't know what else to like try. Well, looks like the only answer is for you to solo cast. I guess that's Boy. the only thing. I've... Otherwise, uh, some of the suggestions I have require us being off stream. And can't do it till this is done. Hmm. All the audio settings are basic. So they're all pumpkin latte? <laughs> that sounds delicious right now. Oh my god, I want to use that from now on. Like, can you just go disable all your pumpkin latte settings? What? You know, your basic settings. Well, we have a couple of people on line for you to play, but apparently their opponents aren't here. Yeah, that's uh, the problem is... we're having. Uh, they were all here and then they left, something like that. I'm not sure. So we're just letting you guys know that we're not, not just dick for no reason. It, it is downtime. Yeah. Is my all messed up, or is that clear still or no? No, oh, it's still messed up. I don't know. Let me try just not having video broadcast. Maybe that clears it up. Okay. So if I'm just talking like this, my video off. Yeah, I'd cut like immediately. I mean, I don't want to ditch you here, but I just don't see the point of me being here. I can't cast. We're here for moral support and keep dancing for you. That I can't see. It's not my fault you missed out some really sexy dance moves. It can't be on Rifkin's side. Damn boy. Like it it literally is not on my end. See, the problem is that it's like, okay, maybe this doesn't happen when I stream and I stream all the time, but it's still something that should get fixed so you don't have to deal with this. And for those who are wondering if it's because she's streaming and it's taxing everything on her computer, it's like this when she's not streaming and barely anything open. I mean, does this happen when we're playing Overwatch? Well, that's a good question. We haven't streamed enough together for you to know. I don't think so. Not so far. I think it only happens like once or twice every couple of weeks. Turn it off and on again. Everyone thinks we're using Skype, but we're not. That's the thing, because we thought Skype was the issue, so we swapped to another program. <sighs> Pumpkin Skype, super basic. <laughs> I'm good at making jokes. Let me see if I can get Fear Dragon come uh, replace me. If not replace me, at least test Mike's. See if his cuts out too. That would be interesting. An interesting experiment is afoot. Potentially. Yeah. 
Uh, sorry, folks, for, for this hiccuping during the CSL. We just kind of assumed it'd be fine because last time we cast CSL, it was all fine. Did you ever use your speed dial? What? On your phone? Like, the numbers you put in, like hotkeys? No. I don't yeah. think I even have any assigned. I have like three people I would ever call. There's you, who I can't afford to call because you live in the States. Uh, there's my home number, which I'm at home, so I don't need to worry about that. <laughs> and there would be... Oh, no. I just realized I need to change that contact number. So only two. I only have two numbers that would speed dial on. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any either. Ready to go into a lobby? Yes. Okay, so I think I got Fear Dragon. That'd be cool. If you can Griffin's face really classes up the place. What? You should have seen my mom, guys. Oh god, no. <laughs> she had this like plan, man. I don't know why, but she was just like, you know what you should do? Okay, um, if you're doing so, he'll come. So, do you want? I'm just gonna hang up and you can just cast the best of five with him. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go talk to Olivia about some stuff, anyways. So, uh, do you see yourself, people? If you can even hear this, thank you for. I didn't do anything tonight. Uh. Thank you for enjoying Zombie Rub's cast. Free Dragon's gonna come take over, and hopefully, he won't have these same issues. So, hopefully. you have to go poke him for the Zoom room or something. Bye. Bye. This meeting was ended by the host. I need a beer right back anyway, so one second.